we'll have a short talk about uh, intraoperative uh, mechanical ventilation and how can we be protective when we care of our patients. I hope you can hear me well. It's a bit noisy in the space. Uh, this is more or less uh, uh, the, the schedule of the topics we will try to go through. We will try to focus on the pathophysiological background of uh, protective ventilation applied uh, to the topic of intraoperative ventilation. We will provide a short uh, snapshot on what we do currently, what is our current clinical practice uh, and whether it can be improved uh, somehow. We will uh, focus on the aspects uh, of uh, intraoperative ventilation on which we have some kind of definitive answer uh, arising from randomized uh, trial and uh, uh, in areas of our uh, clinical practice in which we don't have uh, cl uh, clinical evidence deriving from randomized trial and probably we will never have. And so this is the place where uh, physiology comes uh, uh, in place and understanding of uh, mechanical ventilation is really important. Uh, we have a clinical snapshot uh, of uh, what happens uh, nowadays in our operating rooms. Uh, whenever you see a QR code, you can scan it. It's the PDF uh, uh, of the of the research paper I'm citing in the slide. Uh, this was a, a research uh, sponsored by the European Society of Anesthesia, so it's nice to remember it uh, here. Uh, this was a study in which the, the practice uh, of mechanical ventilation during general anesthesia was very well described uh, in, in a large uh, cohort uh, of more than 8,000 uh, patients uh, from 29 countries around uh, the world, mostly in uh, Europe. It starts being uh, a bit outdated. Maybe we need an update uh, uh, on the clinical uh, uh, scenario nowadays after 10 years of publication of intraoperative mechanical uh, ventilation, but still it's a picture of what's going on when our patient receives mechanical ventilation for surgery. Uh, most of the things uh, we know about mechanical ventilation are derived uh, from the knowledge acquired uh, in the ICU. And we think about uh, protective ventilation as a mean to protect the baby lung of an ARDS patient. But sometimes we should think about the fact that probably also surgical patients have uh, a kind of baby lung. In fact, if you take uh, a large animal, and that's what we did uh, uh, several decades ago, uh, and you put it in, in, in a CT scanner, you will see that the only effect of inducing neuromuscular blockade, general anesthesia, and intubating the animal, in this case an horse, induces a, the formation of large uh, atelectasis uh, in the dorsal regions. Mm more pragmatically, if we switch from an animal to a human being, uh, we see, we, we don't do it for our clinical practice, we did it for research, for understanding what happens inside the lungs uh, when a patient receives uh, general anesthesia, you see the formation of uh, posterior atelectasis, uh, which are worsened by obesity, positioning, intra-abdominal pressure, and several factors uh, that coexist inside the, the operating room. Why do we care about atelectasis? It's one of the points leading to uh, postoperative pulmonary complication. When we think about the clinical entities that we name uh, postoperative pulmonary complication, in particular respiratory failure and respiratory infection, this is just the tip of an iceberg the, of which the base is uh, uh, made up of the pathophysiological alteration that occur in our patients uh, when we induce uh, uh, anesthesia and when we ventilate uh, them. And it's nowadays proven that even minor uh, postoperative complication have consequences. For example, in this study in obese patients, uh, we demonstrated that the occurrence of postoperative pulmonary complication increases uh, the duration of hospital stay, which is not surprising at all. But when we stratified the severity of postoperative pulmonary complication and we considered the oxygen need as a complication alone, so just the fact of going out from the PACU with the two liters uh, of uh, nasal oxygen per se increases increases uh, the duration of hospital stay by one day, more or less, which is, uh, if not clinically relevant, for sure relevant uh, from uh, a socioeconomical uh, standpoint. So the determinants of perioperative risk in surgical patients uh, are, some of them are out of our uh, reach, some of them are uh, patient-related, such as obesity, BMI, uh, OSAS, uh, patient comorbidities, uh, and the changes uh, in respiratory function that occur when we induce uh, anesthesia. But some of them uh, can be changed. Uh, the, the, the general anesthesia technique we use and the settings we use for intraoperative ventilation. 
other factors stay on the other side of the operating bed and are related more to the surgeon than what we can change uh, with our hands uh, and uh, using the knobs uh, of the ventilator. So uh, we mentioned before what we do now. The description arising from the Las Vegas study, the one that I've mentioned before, is a population of surgical patients receiving more or less the same ventilation settings. Most of the patients received uh, exactly 500 ml of uh, tidal volume, which incidentally is the default setting of, of most uh, ventilators. So it's uh, an alarm sign that many of us might just turn on the ventilator and let him ventilate the patient. But when we normalize this value for the predicted body weight, which is the right thing we should do to target the tidal volume in surgical patient, we see that the distribution is much wider. We, we have still patients receiving uh, 9, 10, 11 ml per kilo, which are probably uh, harmful in uh, surgical patients. When it comes to PEEP, it looks more like a, a political poll rather than a physiological variable. It's like there is the Z party, the five uh, centimeter of water party, and the uh, clinician tend to choose uh, one or either. Uh, and another, do, uh, another thing we do quite often is uh, doing recruitment maneuvers. In this analysis, uh, we only uh, investigated how many patients received the recruitment maneuver on a regular basis, namely not to overcome uh, an oxygenation impairment. Just, uh, for example, every 30 minutes, every hour, uh, after two hours of general anesthesia. And we have seen that this practice of recruiting periodically the patient is seldom used. It's only used in two to four percent of patients. But in most cases, when clinicians decide to perform a recruitment maneuver, they still use the bag squeezing technique. So switching the ventilator to manual mode and uh, squeezing the, the anesthesia bag, uh, which we will see it's a, a questionable uh, approach. Evidence-based ventilation, we had several large uh, randomized uh, trials in the field uh, of uh, protective mechanical ventilation in the intraoperative setting. Uh, we, we know much more than we used to know uh, 20 years ago. Uh, one of the uh, milestone studies uh, in, in this field was uh, the study in, published uh, in the New England in 2013. Uh, they compared two strategies, one zip with a very large tidal volume, 10 to 12 ml per kilogram of, of predicted body weight, uh, versus a strategy with a moderate PIP level of 6 to 8 centimeters of water and a low tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kilogram. Uh, the incidence of post-operative complication was uh, much lower in the experimental group, the one using uh, a moderate PIP plus a reduction of tidal volume. One of the problem of this of this study is that it tested two interventions together, the reduction of tidal volume and uh, the application of some level of PEEP. So the following studies tried to identify which of the ingredients of protective ventilation is more important uh, in the surgical patient. And unfortunately, we have two uh, neutral studies, so two studies that did not show any difference. This was the Provilo study in which the same protective tidal volume, 7 ml per kilo, was compared at a very low low PIP level of, of below two centimeters of water, including zip, uh, and uh, another strategy with a very high uh, PIP of 12 centimeters of water, plus uh, uh, cyclic uh, recruitment maneuvers performed uh, with ventilator. And uh, in this case, the incidence of post-operative pulmonary complication was exactly identical in the two groups. Even more recently, and this is a study that ma many of us have missed in the literature because it was published uh, during the first wave of COVID, we were probably all uh, focused uh, on other urgent uh, aspects of mechanical ventilation, they did the, other, the opposite. They kept uh, uh, the same level of PEEP in the two groups, uh, five centimeters of water, and they compared uh, a very restrictive versus a more liberal tidal volume. They uh, allowed up to 10 ml per kilo. And also in this case, uh, we could not find uh, uh, statistical significance uh, uh, between uh, the two groups. However, despite these two negative uh, trials, we still have very strong uh, physiopathological rationale to use uh, uh, low tidal volume, or at least to keep an eye on tidal volume. Because 
all this trial included very heterogeneous populations uh, and the risk uh, is translating uh, the concept uh, identified uh, in the general population when I treat my single patient which can be obese, uh, severely uh, comorbid in an extreme body positioning due to robotic uh, or laparoscopic surgery. The there is one paper showing very well why one should target the tidal volume to the predicted body weight uh, and not to the actual body weight. In this uh, paper, uh, two ICU patients uh, of the same gender, the same uh, similar age and the exactly the same height uh, were scanned with the CT. The only difference between the two patients was uh, the weight and consequently the BMI. Uh, on the top row, you see a patient uh, uh, with uh, 21 uh, of body mass index and in, in the other one, you see a 52. You see that the 3D re reconstruction of the lungs uh, gives the exact uh, same volume of the two uh, lungs of the two patients. So uh, this is the rationale behind uh, uh, normalizing the tidal volume to the predicted and not uh, the actual body weight. So the industry helps us uh, in several ways. Uh, most of modern ventilators allow setting uh, the tidal volume in a way that it's immediately displayed uh, how many ml per kilo we are administering to a patient. For example, we see if we set uh, the patient uh, gender and the patient height, uh, we obtain uh, the predicted body weight and consequently uh, the same uh, tidal volume for predicted body weight uh, results in very different uh, tidal volumes uh, according to the patient uh, size. So in this, this is a, a quite extreme example, decreasing the height of the patient from 170 centimeters to 100 and then to 50. To see that the same uh, applied uh, tidal volume for predicted body weight will, of course, result in very different uh, uh, absolute tidal volumes uh, in MLs. Uh, another important uh, aspect is the fact that uh, I know you probably uh, will wait for a final answer on how much PEEP should I use in my surgical patient and the literature uh, is not able of providing a magic answer. Uh, we, we must keep in mind the physiology in this case and remember that there is a strong correlation between uh, two aspects uh, of uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, this is a study uh, in which PEEP was titrated with the electrical impedance tomography, so uh, a modern technique uh, uh, that allows uh, identifying which areas of the lung are collapsing and which are not. But regardless of this uh, sophisticated technique, the message of this correlation is the highest uh, the BMI, the highest the PEEP required to keep the lung open, and also the closed circles uh, represent uh, laparoscopy. So what do obesity and laparoscopy have in common is increased uh, intra-abdominal pressure. So uh, everything pushing on the diaphragm and preventing the lung to expand uh, requires higher levels of PEEP to be counteracted. We start having some evidence-based data in support of the use of PEEP, at least in some kind of patients. This is a meta-analysis of individual patient data, so it's not a conventional meta-analysis. It's merging the databases of different studies together. And uh, even if the conclusion of this uh, meta-analysis uh, in total was that we cannot recommend the use uh, of all IPIP and the recruitment maneuver in all surgical patients, we still have a very important signal, which is that patients receiving laparoscopic surgery have a strong advantage when, uh, uh, comparing, when using higher PEEP level as compared to, to low PEEP levels. And also there is a strong signal uh, reaching significance for abdominal surgery. So anytime something happens in the abdomen, either with the, the use of high uh, intra-abdominal pressures for the pneumoperitoneum or uh, long and prolonged manipulation of uh, uh, abdominal organs by the surgeon, uh, we should consider using uh, at least some PEEP. I cannot give you a magical number, but we have some 
uh, magical number deriving from the next uh, uh, step of this presentation, which is the role of the driving pressure, which was not mentioned uh, uh, before on purpose. The driving pressure is defined uh, as the difference between plateau pressure and uh, uh, positive end expiratory pressure. Ideally, it should be measured uh, with a manual inspiratory pose, uh, which is not available in most uh, uh, operating room ventilators, but still you can have a dynamic plateau setting an end inspiratory pose uh, during volume control ventilation. In pressure control mode, uh, it's uh, a bit tricky. Uh, one could think uh, about uh, uh, switching uh, temporarily to volume control ventilation uh, uh, to measure more precisely the plateau pressure, especially if we lower the respiratory rate, uh, we can obtain a longer plateau time and have a more accurate measurement uh, uh, of the driving pressure. However, in most uh, uh, studies in the OR, the driving pressure was simply measured uh, as difference between the dynamic uh, plateau and the peep. And what we have seen in this uh, study is that there is a dose response uh, uh, correlation between the driving pressure and the incidence of post-operative pulmonary complication. It's not mathematically given that if I manage to lower the driving pressure, I will lower the incidence of complication, but for sure having a high uh, driving pressure is bad, at least as a marker of increased uh, risk of developing post-operative uh, uh, pulmonary complication. In this study, taking out the data from randomized trials in which we could compare between low and high PEEP strategies, we have seen that there was no statistical, uh, statistically significant difference when we increased the PEEP in order to reduce the driving pressure. But we have an important alarm sign in, in the last uh, uh, bar of the graph. So if I have a patient with a high driving pressure, I try increasing PEEP uh, to recruit the lungs. And instead of decreasing the driving pressure, the driving pressure increases, or in other words, the respiratory system compliance worsens. I'm doing something bad for the patient. It's not just an association. And in this case, it, it, it's data coming from randomized studies. Patients that increased the dermy pressure uh, after setting PEEP were patients that developed more postoperative pulmonary complications. So we want anesthesia ventilators uh, and anesthesia machines that are capable of displaying in real time uh, all the markers of injuriousness of mechanical ventilation and driving pressure. We have seen it. It's an important uh, marker. Let's focus back on this plot. We have seen the right most uh, extreme example. So I increase PEEP, the driving pressure increases, the compliance worsens, the patient goes uh, uh, worse and develops more uh, complication. But we see this is the, the reference group. So no change in PEEP and nothing happens. This is just the reference. We see that there is a signal in fa favor uh, it's not significantly, uh, statistically significant, but there is a trend in favor of uh, setting PEEP uh, with the aim of reducing the driving pressure. There was one single uh, large randomized uh, trial that attempted uh, to do so, and there is one large uh, uh, randomized trial ongoing from the ProofNet, uh, which is the um, designation trial. Uh, this was a complex study with four uh, intervention arms, but one important message uh, we have is that the group that received PEEP titration based uh, on uh, driving pressure, namely I change PEEP until the driving pressure is the lowest possible value, has a lower incidence of post-operative pulmonary complication as compared to the group receiving a standard uh, PEEP level and no adjustment according to the driving pressure. Uh, this study has several limitations. It's complex, it's four groups, uh, uh, but still we have a message from that. And uh, so we have seen uh, that for sure, driving pressure is a marker of increased risk. So what should I do if I identify a patient with high uh, driving pressure? First, uh, I have to check whether the tidal volume is correct. Uh, we have seen before that trials say, OK, in most patients, you can maybe tolerate even uh, 8, 9 ml per kilo. So we are not killing our patient if we just uh, uh, set a more or less standard tidal volume and leave the patient as it is. This is valid for most patients. But if I set the tidal volume maybe a bit inaccurately, and we all know that the routine in the OR is uh, extremely stressful, and sometimes we simply don't have time to think about each number of the 
ventilator, maybe because we are busy in uh, more stringent tasks. But if I identify a patient in which my standard 500 ml result in a very high driving pressure, 18 centimeters of water, uh, this could be an obese patient, maybe undergoing uh, rod robotic surgery in uh, Trendelenburg uh, positioning. One thing we, we can do for sure to reduce the driving pressure, and I cannot say it's evidence-based, there's no study that demonstrated that this approach uh, reduced the com uh, incidence of complication, but it's perfectly reasonable. The first thing I have to do is check whether this 500 ml for that patient was okay. And if it's not, decreasing the tidal volume mathematically reduces the driving pressure. At the same elastic properties of the lung, if I give less volume, I will develop less uh, uh, driving pressure. And this could reduce the incidence of uh, postoperative pulmonary complication. We have also mentioned uh, the importance uh, of uh, recruitment maneuvers. Uh, uh, many of us perform it uh, as a rescue measure. If the patient desaturates, uh, it's probably perfectly reasonable. Once we have uh, checked uh, the correct uh, positioning of the tubing, we have correct, uh, correctly informed uh, the surgeon to stop touching things uh, and uh, uh, checking if something hap happened on the respiratory circuit. If we think that the desaturation uh, is justified by a loss of aeration in the lung, the reaction of doing a recruitment maneuver seems to be perfectly reasonable. And uh, I don't know what is your uh, current uh, clinical practice, but you tend to notice the recruitment earlier if you normally ventilate with lower FiO2s, because if you leave 50% uh, FiO2 in all surgical patients, uh, you will identify the saturation only when uh, half of the lung tissue is collapsed because 50% FiO2 will compensate uh, the shunt effect uh, in, in the collapsed area. But let's say we have identified that our patient correctly uh, requires uh, uh, recruitment maneuvers. We still can perform the recruitment maneuver manually, and uh, I don't know in which uh, center you work and how common is recruitment uh, uh, done by back squeezing in your institution. But believe me, it's very heterogeneous. There are hospitals in which people laugh when I show uh, back squeezing, I say, oh, we don't do it since 20 years. And other centers uh, in which it's still common practice. So I have to give a general message uh, and uh, I hope th uh, to change uh, the clinical practice, at least of, of some of you or, of, or maybe of your colleagues. Uh, we have seen uh, in, uh, in this uh, study coming from Las Vegas uh, uh, data, so it's a sub-study focused on obese patients, that patients that received back squeezing recruitment maneuvers uh, during surgery, not for desaturation, just for a preventive measure, not only did not have a lower incidence uh, of uh, PPCs, but actually doubled the risk uh, of developing postoperative pulmonary complication as compared to patients that did not receive uh, uh, recruitment maneuvers. The, the last uh, ro two rows uh, reflect uh, what happens if we use recruitment maneuvers as rescue uh, strategies. Of course, patients receiving recruitment maneuvers as a rescue are patients that develop some kind of intraoperative complication, so we are not surprised that any patient that received the rescue recruitment maneuver has more complication in the post-op. But what scares us is that if we think we are doing the best for our patient, giving some uh, recruitment maneuver every half an hour, every one hour after a long manipulation uh, in the abdomen, pay attention because uh, uh, the Ventilator-driven ventilator maneuvers at least do not uh, harm the patient, but manual uh, recruitment maneuver could increase uh, uh, the incidence of postoperative pulmonary complications. So uh, most uh, anesthesia machines nowadays uh, allow uh, performing recruitment maneuver uh, with the, the ventilator. Even if you have a very old ventilator, actually, you can just uh, increase PEEP, increase the plateau pressure, increase uh, uh, the, the volume in volume control mode. But most modern ventilation allow uh, doing either uh, 
a single step maneuver, which reflects what we normally would do with the anesthesia balloon. So we deliver a constant pressure for a certain amount of time. And the most advanced ventilators also allow setting several steps in which pressures are increased uh, stepwise. So I'm not saying that every patient should receive recruitment maneuvers, but if we decide that our patient requires uh, recruitment maneuvers, uh, it's definitely better doing it with the ventilator as compared to uh, the traditional uh, inflation of the anesthesia machine. And we have uh, seen this slide before, at least the CT scan of this slide as compared to the horse one. And we know from physiological studies that the application of recruitment maneuvers and PEEP, and this is a study again in obese patients which are at higher risk of developing post-operative atelectasis, uh, the combination of recruitment maneuver uh, and PEEP is the best we can do to keep the lung open, which is not something we, we should do at any price, but if we can keep the ventilation within, within safe uh, uh, thresholds uh, and uh, have uh, uh, and avoiding the loss of aeration in the dorsal region, we could improve uh, the care of our patient. So to, I decided to conclude uh, uh, with a comment. Uh, how do I identify a high-risk patient? I think that we have heard about scores uh, and uh, stratification of risk according to several uh, online tools, but think about a score. If you have a score to predict post-operative respiratory complication, I think I would be happy of having a score like this, that when it's the low class risk, I have 5% complication. The second stage, 10%. The third one, 20%. The fourth one, uh, 25%. I would be happy of having a prediction score like this one. Guess what? You already have it, because this is the ASA classification. So I guess you do it every day. And when you identify a high-risk patient for comorbidities, it's also a patient that will have a higher risk of respiratory postoperative pulmonary complication. Uh, there was a consensus uh, in 2019. Again, you can download uh, the paper. It's open access. Uh, it's an expert consensus, which is the procedure that experts uh, adopt when they don't have answers for everything. We would like to randomize patients uh, in uh, super large uh, randomized trials, but we are not able to do it uh, uh, as much as we want to, because it takes uh, time and it takes uh, money to organize randomized trials. So sometimes we have to sit on a table and decide uh, what's the best for our patient based uh, on uh, what is available on the literature, even if it's not uh, large randomized trial. I just wanted to point out some of the statements of, of this uh, expert consensus. Uh, first of all, uh, moderate quality of added dense and high uh, strength uh, of uh, recommendation. Use a low tidal volume protective uh, ventilation strategy, ideally 6, 8 ml per kilo. Uh, ZIP is not recommended. We cannot state which level of PEEP is best for all patients, but at least we can disencourage the use uh, of zero uh, and expiratory uh, pressure. This could reduce the incidence of postoperative pulmonary complication. Uh, the ventilator should be set initially to deliver these settings, so protected type of volume and some level of PEEP. We cannot give any recommendation on the I2E ratio. PEEP should be individualized uh, in order to avoid increases in the driving pressure, so keep an eye on the driving pressure. And in addition to the standard monitoring required by our European and American societies, also keep an eye on the driving pressure because it has been several times strongly linked to the development of post-operative pulmonary complications. And the bag squeezing man recruitment maneuver, we know that the quality of evidence is very low. We only have observational studies. We will probably never have a randomized trial in which we will randomize 1,000 patients receiving bag squeezing versus uh, uh, ventilator-driven recruitment maneuver, but we, that's what we have. And, and the panel of experts stated to avoid bag squeezing maneuver. So to, to conclude, consider monitoring the driving pressure. PEEP, start with low PEEP, maybe five centimeter water, maybe a bit less if your ventilator allows it. Considering an increase of PEEP in obese, in laparoscopy, in robotic surgical procedure requiring, requiring Trendelenburg, in abdominal surgery, and uh, don't increase PEEP if 
increasing PIP, it results in increased uh, driving pressure or, in other words, worsening of the respiratory system uh, compliance. So also avoid manual recruitment maneuvers. We have seen we don't have definitive data, but still it's an important message. And for the tidal volume, we can start with a low moderate. It's six, six eight. Actually, if I have to be strictly evidence-based, I should tell you 6 to 10, because in the average patient, probably 10 is not that bad in the surgical setting. But if, if that tidal volume uh, results in high pressures in my specific patient, that's the time to consider rethink the, uh, rethinking the PIP level I've chosen before and lowering the tidal volume if I have been uh, too much uh, liberal. So in, my last message is that not as much as in the ICU, but we cannot just ventilate uh, the surgical patient uh, with the default setting of the ventilation, because protective ventilation matters also in the OR. Thank you.